not put All right. Well, do you think we should go, Demi? Yeah, I see that Tomer has is in the in the participant. So um, good, excellent. Everybody's here, so we can we can start. It's for me one o'clock in the afternoon, for you seven in the morning, and for the rest of the world on the hour. So we can start. Yes, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time zone uh, you're in, welcome. Um, I'm Shelley James, and you're in the Contributed Oral 3 session, um, the third, third Contributed Oral session for, for Chadwick 2021. Um, we're grateful for the tech support for the, this morning from the University of Florida conference team. Um, and uh, along with Dimitri, um, we're your moderators for this session. Um, and um, I personally join you today from the lands of the Wajak Noongar people. And I acknowledge the custodians of the lands and the waters from where the collections and the data that we work with have been gathered and now reside. And I pay my respects to elders of all lands, past, present, well, all elders of all lands, past, present and emerging. This session is being recorded for later viewing. And I just remind all the presenters to please speak slowly and clearly for our many international viewers. We have a fabulous lineup of talks for this session. Each presenter will present for about 10 minutes. Um, I'll alert each presenter at eight minutes and, and then cut you off at 13. Hopefully that will have to happen. Please ask questions of the speakers using the question and answer feature in Hoover, um, if possible, otherwise Zoom. And um, Jimmy will present um, these questions to the speakers. Um, Louise was also part of um, the moderator team, but he unfortunately he is um, unfortunately unwell. Um, the chat function um, has, uh, in both Zoom and Hoover, has been made available for technical questions and for conversing with other attendees. Please use this wisely, as any inappropriate use of the chat may result in using one mode from the session or the chat feature being disabled. And please see our conference code of conduct document for more information. And as always, please bear with us if we have any technical difficulties um, and enjoy the session. And up first, we have Peter Desmond speaking about CAMTRAP DP. And I'm going to stop my sharing and you can fire away, Peter. Okay, can you hear me okay? Okay, welcome everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. So, uh, hi, I'm Peter Desmet. I'm going to present CamTrap DP, a frictionless data exchange format for camera trapping data, which is being maintained by me and also Ben Norton and uh, Jacob Pupnicki, who are also co presenters of this presentation. So, oh, this is going too fast. Camera trapping is a well-established wildlife monitoring techniques in which cameras are attached at certain places to capture wildlife that is passing. It is uh, non-invasive, so it doesn't really bother the, uh, the animals and it enables the study of animal abundance, distribution and behavior. And it is a very data intensive technique uh, because it can generate lots of images or videos. Typically, this data, uh, we're in a state now that these data are well managed, 
uh, but not shared. There's a number of data management platforms such as a good tea, trapper, eMammal and wildlife insights, in which researchers can upload and manage data. And then uh, the system will organize this, allowing the researcher to also annotate these images or videos with species identifications. And very often or more and more uh, image recognition and AI is used to automate this task. However, there is limited data exchange between these platforms. They act a little bit as communities on their own, uh, as silos. And there's also limited data publication from these platforms. And that is why we got together and thinking what could be a good format to at least um, facilitate this exchange. And the first one that comes to mind is uh, Darwin Core uh, or the Darwin Core archive format, but unfortunately that one does not capture the full scope of uh, a camera trapping study. Uh, for example, the project setup or camera setup is a bit uh, difficult to capture in Darwin Core. And also many of the images are blank, vehicle or unknown, uh, which also need to be annotated. So these are not species observations, but other kinds of annotations. Also the star schema in Darwin Core Archive is too limited to capture all the relationships. But I think most importantly is that the camera trap researcher do not know this format and it is a bit of a clunky, awkward way to format their data in that format. So that is why we started with CamTrap DP, which stands for Camera Trap Data Package. And it is designed to capture all essential data and metadata of a single camera trap study. It is a model to exchange camera trapping data and also a format to exchange camera trapping data. On the model, a typical camera trap study, um, this is going too fast. Um, is uh, you have the metadata about the project. You have a number of cameras that are deployed. Uh, from a certain start until an end date with location and camera information and the settings for your camera. And then um, these cameras will capture either by motion detection or on a regular interval uh, pictures, very often series of pictures or videos, um, which are media files. Uh, those typically have a file path, a URL, a timestamp, and they can also be grouped in sequences, which are series of images that belong together. And then the annotation can happen at two levels. Either you annotate each individual image, saying what species you have observed in this image, the number of individuals or other properties, or you identify the sequence as a whole. And these two annotation techniques, uh, the CamTrap DP format can accommodate both. The format itself, uh, we have a data package JSON file, which captures all the metadata about the uh, the, the data files itself and the structure and also the project information. So it can be a bit compared with an Darwin Core Archive EML file and the Meta XML file combined. And then the data itself are CSV files, deployments, media and observations with relationships between those. We did not invent this format. Um, we are building on top of uh, frictionless standards, which is developed, developed by frictionless data. And it is a set of open specifications, JSON schemas, uh, that can also be combined. So you have the standard data package to describe data sets, data resource for data files, and table schemas to describe the fields of tabular data. But a data package can include data resources and table schemas. So all of these can be combined in a single JSON file. The whole philosophy of uh, frictionless standards is it is simple machine usable and extensible, which is why we used it for CamTrap DP. So the development of CamTrap DP, it is now a repository under the GitHub or, under the, the GitHub repository under the Tetric organization. It's open, versioned and collaborative from the very beginning. And we define two types of files. One, a CamTrap DP profile, which is describing the properties that are required to describe a camera trap study. Uh, such as project metadata, but also the spatial, temporal, and taxonomic scope. And then we have three table schemas for the uh, deployments, observations, and multimedia. And these table schemas describe the fields, their definitions, the data types that are required, some constraints, and also controlled vocabularies, as well as the relationships between those files. If um, a data set is published under this format. The, um, so we have already published one on Zenodo. Uh, the link is at the bottom left. 
um, but the data package JSON file in that um, data set links out to those four schemas. Those are the, the yellow, the, the orange links that you see on the right. So you can say, I have a file called deployments and it is of this schema type. Uh, and you can do the same with the metadata. I have metadata and it is of this profile. The big advantage of uh, using frictionless data is or frictionless standards is that there is already software available. Um, and one of the most useful one is frictionless PI, which allows you to validate if a data set complies with the CAMPRAP DP specification. So that will then check the metadata, the structure, the fields, the controlled vocabularies, and the relationships and give warnings and errors for uh, those aspects in your data set that do not meet the specifications. So that is a very good um, way before publishing your data to assess data quality. We've also developed an R package to easily read data uh, that is structured as a data package. So this does not only work for Kempler BP, but for any data package. And that is what you see on the right. So I can link, just read the URL of a data package that is published on Zenodo. And that is my entry point to my whole data set. I can uh, ask for the names, of the resource, uh, resources in that data set, and then just load uh, a resource as a data frame in R. Um, we're also working with the data management platforms, a good deep trapper, wildlife insights to make CampTrapDP an export format so users don't have to do the conversion. Um, we have not forgotten about Darwin Core. It is possible to do a lossy transformation to Darwin Core, where you only retain the, the animal observations and you link the observations with the uh, media files. And we have documented this as well. And for each term in CAMTRAP DP that has an equivalent in Dublin or Darwin Core, we have indicated so as well, this as well. And we hope with uh, the work um, that is being done on extending to a more global model for biodiversity data that CAMTRAP DP files can be harvested directly and can link to that model. So users don't have to also convert the data into Darwin Core. Um, this is something that um, can be automated on the fly. Minutes. So in summary, CAMTRAP DP is designed to capture all the essential data, metadata of a camera trap study. It is a data exchange model, a simplified model, and a format. Uh, the format makes use of frictionless standards, three ones in specific, data package, which we have extended to capture more metadata, data resource, and table schemas, where we have defined three table schemas for the three data files that are in the CAMTRAP DP. Um, there is built-in validation, which can really improve data quality before publishing and also when using. And the uh, format is open versioned and collaborative. Uh, there's a website that has been created on top of these three, uh, of these four files that we have that uh, presents it in a human readable way as well. Thank you. Uh, hi Peter, I think we, I think we have time for one or two questions, and we have two questions uh, in the Q and A. Uh, first question from BJ: uh, What attributes does Adobe Core lack when it comes to camera trap data? You have an idea on that? So, for example, with the camera, it is very important to know if you have used bait or not, uh, at what height and what angle the camera was directed. Um, if um, you have aligned them in a session. So there's a couple of properties that uh, do not really capture the, the whole, it's like, yeah, a much more extended version of the sampling protocol and more information that we want to capture in a more structured format. I hope Vijay that this answers your question. Uh, we go to the second one. Um, can you lossy transform absence observation from CanCrab DB to Darwin Core? So what about absence observations? Um, yes, but I think this um, it is this is more uh, there's more research involved in this to be able to calculate abundances of species. Um, you need to take the raw data and then do actual science with it and analysis before you can calculate absences. So all of this depends on how easy it is to um, 
like capture images, uh, what the detection distance is. So from the raw data, I would say no, from the derived data, maybe. Okay, thank you, Peter. If there's no more questions, then we'll move see. on. All right. So the next speaker we have, Sylvain Morin, uh, connecting Western Central African herbaria data, a new living atlas region data platform. Hello everyone, uh, let me share my screen. Is it okay? Okay. So I'm Sylvain Morin, I'm software engineer at uh, the Museum of Paris, and I'm working for the French node of JBIF. So today I will present you a project of deploying a regional data platform for West and Central African herbaria. So, uh, this project is funded by the BID program, um, led by JBIF. It started in uh, April uh, 2021 and will last two years until uh, April uh, 2023. Um, my objective during this talk is to show you that some of the great tools already available in the biodiversity community, which put together allow us to easily connect our data. So in this project, we will connect herbarium data from six countries. So Benin, Cameroon, Côte d'Ivoire, Gabon, Guinea Conakry, and Togo for a total of more than 200,000 specimens. C currently, these data are not or only partially public. And this data platform will make them all available on jbif.org and on the new West and Central African portal. It will also ease the sharing of future additional data. So this platform will be built on top of three tools, RIA, IPT, and Living Atlases Portal. The first one is RIA, uh, which stands for uh, Réseau Informatique des Herbiers d'Afrique, so Digital Network of African Herbaria. It has been developed by Hervé Chevillot from uh, IRD France. And, and the key feature of this web application is to allow herbarium data manager to enter their specimen data or referential data like taxonomy or bibliography. It's really a data management application built for herbarium data. It also has some public web pages to openly display the herbarium data captured on, on this platform. For the project, we will deploy a single RIA instance uh, here, shared by the six countries. This is a cake PHP application. We will deploy six PostgreSQL databases one for each country to assure data ownership. We will set up existing user accounts and train herbarium data managers so they can enter new data or amend existing ones. About existing data, our main task, the, the longest one, is the initial data migration from all different existing sources to the RIA data model. That's a long task, but a one-time task, since after that, the previous tools and the sources will be decommissioned. Uh, only RIA will be used. The next tool is the IPT, which stands for Integrated Publishing Toolkit. So it's developed by jbif.org with contribution from others like, like us at uh, JB France. Uh, the key feature of this web application is to generate Darwin Core Archive from your data. So your data can be a CSV file or like in our case, a database source since the IPT has natively a database connector to fetch data. Then you can express your mapping with, IPT, with the IPT between your data model and the Darwin Core model. And finally, you can use the automatic publication feature to automate periodically all the workflow, fetching data from database, executing the mapping to generate a new Darwin Core archive and publish it to jbif.org. Because indeed, uh, the IPT developed by jbif has the feature to send your data to jbif.org in, uh, in just a click. On this project, we will deploy a single IPT and set up six data sets, one by country. 
uh, we will configure the data set uh, SQL query to retrieve data from the RIA database and then configure the Darwin core mapping from the RIA model. Since the six countries are sharing the same RIA data model, the data set configuration on the IPT will be simpler, nearly just a copy of each other. And finally, we will activate the auto-publishing feature of the IPT to publish periodically to jbif.org every changes. So when an urban data manager will add or amend a specimen in RIA, it will be reflected in jbif.org really soon and automatically. The last tool is a Living Atlasis portal developed by ALA and by the Living Atlasis community. So the key feature of Living Atlasis is to offer an open platform to search, display, or download data. It's natively connected to the IPT and it's entirely customizable. What is great with this solution is that it's flexible, adaptable regarding to your needs and skills. If you want a low level of customization, let's say like just the color or the logo, the fonts, etc., Or if you have a low volume of data, let's say less than a million, this solution is working for you and it's quite easy to deploy. But if you want high level of customization, like which fields are displayed or change the search mechanism, or if you have high volume of data, this solution can also fit these needs perfectly, but it will require more development skills for sure. And in both cases, you have the Living Atlasis community to help you to implement your solution. On this project, we will deploy a single Living Atlasis portal. We will set up the native connection to the IPT to retrieve data. And we will set up an automatic data ingestion using Jenkins as an orchestrator to trigger the data workflow. We will customize the look and feel and also the data pages to create links between the Living Atlasis portal and some public pages of the RIA platform. For example, to access the taxonomy or bibliography pages of RIA. So we will create a single portal, but for both applications. We define this solution with two goals for the future. First, we wanted this solution to be run at a low maintenance cost. So when an herbarium data manager will add or amend a specimen, we expect this change to be available on jb.org and on the Living Atlasis portal without any IT human intervention, thanks to the automated data workflow. And uh, on the same topic of the maintenance, the IPT and the Living Atlasis tools are well maintained by a core group of developers plus a large community, which makes them really reliable. The second goal is about extensibility. How can we add a new member of the West and Central African region to extend the project widely? Or what if, what if uh, a country member wants its own portal focusing on its own data? So for new members, we just have to set up an additional RIA database, duplicate the IPT data set configuration, and that's nearly all we have to do. The new data from the new member will be automatically available on JBIF and on the regional portal. Finally, about deploying sub portals for one country, for example, it's a native feature of Living Atlasis portal. You just have to deploy an additional module, a front end application, something really light in terms of resources. You configure the filter to apply on data to retrieve only the subset you want. For example, the data of only one country. And th this new front end, which become uh, a new entry point for public user, will connect and reuse existing modules already installed. And most importantly, reuse the data storage and just apply a filter on it. So in terms of hardware resources and so ecological cost, it's really a light extension. The easiest modules are shared, no data is duplicated and no resources wasted. Thank you and thanks to all the partners of this project listed here. I hope it will motivate you to look at these great tools and join us in the JB Fendimic Atlasis developer community. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. We have um, several minutes remaining for questions. I have just uh, just see that there are 
is one question coming in um, from Nikki. Uh, could the new GBIF host portal solution be an alternative to the Living Atlas as part of the technical setup? Yes, exactly. Um, the hosted portal, uh, uh, we, we learn about the hosted portal uh, after uh, submitting this big project. So indeed, now we can uh, look, think about it. Um, the only thing is that we have in mind to customize uh, the occurrence pages on the Living Atlasis portal and create links between, as I said, between the portal and the other platform, the real platform. So in this case, using a Living Atlasis uh, living analysis platform is uh, is better because it allows more customization. Okay, thank you, Sylvain. I have another question. Um, I've had this question asked for me of me, and it would be interesting to hear your answer. Why a living analysis portal if you're also publishing to GBIF? Yeah, I understand. Um, as I said, on the Living Atlasis portal, we, we can entirely customize it. And so we can display information that are not uh, displayed on jbif.org, for example. We, are create, we can create easily the link between the, the two applications to, to leverage what is available on RIA and what will not be shared on jbif.org. So that, that's why we are also adding this, uh, this Living Atlasis portal in the, in the whole picture of, uh, of this project. Merci. Thank you, Sylvain. Thank you. And there are no more questions at the moment. So I think we can continue. Yeah, we're a little ahead of time. But, um, I invite Raisa. Thank you, Sylvain. Sylvain. Um, Raisa, if you want to come on, on board. Um, so we've got Raisa, Raisa Maya. Um, aligning standards communities, sustainable Darwin Core, MIXS interoperability, and I've probably completely messed that up. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, that's on me for using an acronym in the title. So that's the mix, um, the minimum information for any sequence standard. And I'll talk about that a bit more. Um, thanks a lot for the introduction, Shelley. And um, yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm Raisa Maya, and together with Pierre Luigi, I'm co leading this sustainable Darwin Core mix interoperability task group. And as you can see already on the title slide, we have a lot of partners involved in that. And um, what brought all of us together is that we saw a common challenge in omics biodiversity data. That's also where the mix standard is coming in. Because omics biodiversity data is when you use omics techniques, such as DNA sequencing, to assess biodiversity. And the challenge that we have here is that for recording the metadata, we actually have two standards that have developed independently. And now that these worlds are coming together, there is a need of alignment between those standards to prevent data silos. And the standards are the Darwin Core standard from Tedwig, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And on then the omics and genomics side, we have the minimum information for any sequence standard from the Genomics Standards Consortium. And by creating that sustainable interoperability between those standards, we also increase the interoperability of data that is stored in some of the major databases that we have in this space. On the left side, you can see those, which again, I believe most of you are familiar with, such as OBIS and GBIF. And then on the right side, we have um, three internationally mandated databases holding the sequence data. And that interoperability layer will also serve them. Um, we can already see that some of the partners have tried to develop solutions to align Darwin Core and the MIX standard more and more. And what we wanted to do with the task group and with what I'm presenting today is to actually bring that one level up. So bring that to the standards organizations and develop um, 
interoperability on that level so that in the future we can avoid the need to even develop any unilateral solutions. And exactly, so to approach that, we brought together this diverse group of strategic partners from the databases, from the standards themselves, data users and publishers as well. Um, and the main aims that we had with this task group um, were, so we had three main aims um, and I'll walk you through all three of those. The first one, which I'd like to highlight first, is to create a mapping between the terms from that one standard to the terms from the other standard. So from Darwin Core to Mix. And when we say mapping, we mean that we do a semantic mapping, specifically looking at each term and thinking about what that means and what value is expected by that, as well as a syntactic mapping, considering how the data is recorded and so what syntax is to be expected. This is becoming particularly important as we move more and more towards automated analyses, where the machine needs to know what value to expect when working with data. And so I'd briefly like to walk you through one of the examples of the mapping here with the Darwin core term of the minimum depth in meters, mapping that to the mixed depth term. So we can already see we have definitions and examples for both of them. And we're using those, uh, specifically the, the definitions, to understand the semantics of the term. We can already see that these don't match exactly. The Darwin core terms expects the upper limit of a range of depth, while the mixed term expects the whole interval. And also some syntactically, they again don't really match because the Darwin core term only expects the value while the mixed term expects both the value and the unit. And so how did we record that? We did that by using the simple standard for ontology sharing. And within that standard, we have, oh, sorry, um, we have a simple structure of relating a subject, in this case, the Darwin core term, to an object, the mixed term, using a predicate um, where we use the SCOS um, predicates. And so for the example that I'm showing here, we could see that the uh, Darwin core term is actually a narrow match to the mixed term because the concept of the Darwin core is narrower, only expecting that um, upper value. And also semantic, uh, syntactically, we have a narrow match because the Darwin core term expects a more precise or a more focused um, input, while the mixed term, as we said, also expects the unit. And so what I just showed you here, we did that for each of the terms within the two standards. And we then um, developed that triple as a um, um, output. And each mapping there is actually accompanied by qualifications that specify what discrepancies can be expected and also how those could be resolved. And so with that, we fulfilled our first aim of creating that mapping. And during the process, we of course naturally noted that some of the terms can't be mapped because mix, um, just from its very nature, has a lot of terms concerning sequencing, whether that's sequencing um, machines, primers used, or PCR conditions, which aren't naturally part of Darwin Core. And to accommodate those terms, we've additionally developed an extension. And We've defined that extension in XML, and it is additionally also available in a human readable form. And so with that combination of having the mapping and the extension, we created that translation layer to um, translate any Darwin Core compliant metadata record into mixed compliant metadata records. What we additionally noted is that within the mix standard, there are also terms around environmental parameters and variables. And what we found is that those quite naturally fit into the measurement of fact extension that Darwin Core already has. 
And so the way that that would look is that we have the, um, the mixed value or the mixed compliant value on the one side, and that can be unpacked when using the measurement of fact extension, moving more towards atomic metadata. And what's great is that we can also, using the mixed IRIs, link that back to the mixed term and um, thereby report on where that value came from. Seven minutes. Thank you. Um, so with all of this, we've dealt with the technical side. And to make sure that that is being sustained in the long term, we've drafted a memorandum of understanding for both the GSC and TADRIC to consider. And within that memorandum of understanding, we have points on um, maintaining the solutions that we developed on hosting those publicly, providing reference implementations to guide the community, and of course, to update any of this when one of the standards or specifications is being updated, either the, the IRIs or the definitions of both. And yeah, with that, we completed the three main aims that we had as a task group. And in addition to that, during the work, we also recognized some other challenges. And I'd just like to highlight some of those um, you can see a full list of recommendations in the report that we wrote. Um, but so the first recommendation would be something that I briefly touched on, and that is that we need to make the data more simple. And that means moving towards more atomic metadata, less customized syntax, and by that making this, these metadata values more universally possible. The second recommendation is to um, officially integrate the mix extension into Darwin Core using the Darwin Core vocabulary enhancement route. And then thirdly, as we've seen with the environmental terms, the overlap between Darwin uh, with Darwin Core and Mix is not only between those two, but also with many communities in the earth and environment um, field. And we recommend also reaching out to those to make sure that we harmonize how we talk about um, environmental variables and values. And yeah, with that, I'd like um, to finish this talk and like to thank all of the task group members for the work that we've done. And thank you for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. Hey, Raisa, 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 thank you for that talk. Um, looks like it was incredibly smooth and understandable because I do not have any questions. Okay. Uh, it's, at the moment, I see it's kind of a, a positive story. Maybe I have a question, uh, what were the, it, it looked so easy, what, are the, what were the difficulties there? But do, can you name some of the, of the things you, you got trouble with? So um, the difficulty is really in how much effort has to go into creating that interoperability layer, which is something that we always um, just had to recognize over and over again, especially during the mapping, because there are such small nuances which can really, when we talk about automated analyses, can really mess up whatever you're trying to do if we don't capture that properly in uh, the mapping that we're doing. Um, but yeah especially with the group that we had bringing all of those diverse stakeholders together. I think that was a great combination to make sure that what we produced um, doesn't only work on paper, but also just double check that that is in line with what is implementable by the major stakeholders in this field. Okay, thank you. I've got one question, one more question. Can I adopt as being developed in RDA? help in the operability. Uh, pardon, could you maybe repeat that again? I had trouble hearing it. Can I adopt as being developed in RDA help in the operability? And this is from Wouter. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I, um, so Wouter, maybe, whether maybe this can be adopted in RDA or yeah, maybe unmute yourself and uh, just ask it yourself if that's possible. Walter, maybe you can explain your question a little bit better because. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I adopt is uh, something that's being developed in in RDA at the moment um, that um, should support uh, interoperability of uh, uh, anything that is recorded in in regards to um, the observations, etc. Could that could that be of help here? Yes, definitely. Um... I think that would be, if you could maybe share some more information with me afterwards, that would definitely be something to, uh, for us to look into and maybe see if we could link that together. Sure, well, I will do that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I don't see any more questions appearing at the moment. So, Shelley, over to you. Thank you, Raisa. Thank, thank you, Raisa. That was great. Very informative. All right, next. In line is uh, John Waller uh, presenting on GBIF data processing and validation. So the floor is yours, John. Um, yes, okay. Uh, I skipped my first slide. Um, yes, so uh, I am working for uh, GBIF, and uh, I think everyone here is familiar with GBIF, but in case you're a, a new attendee, uh, GBIF is a big data aggregator, which uh, aggregates uh, biological information, uh, mostly occurrence records. And uh, we have a lot of data sets which provide these occurrence records and other types of records and a lot of publishers. Um, GBIF.org uh, allows you to explore this huge number of occurrence records and other information uh, very seamlessly and nicely, I think. Uh, you can explore with like an interactive table. You can uh, explore maps, which are a very powerful feature. Uh, here we see just a map of Botswana, all the occurrence records in Botswana. Uh, you can see that this is actually quite a nice map. Uh, the, there's no strange points or anything on this map. And we'll come back to that later. Uh, all right, and then also, uh, there's also a lot of taxonomic information on GBIF as well, because uh, GBIF also uh, processes a lot of checklists and uh, a lot of checklists from PLASI. And so this is a view of a taxonomic treatment that's coming from PLASI. So this is more information coming from GBIF. And of course, uh, each of these data sets that come into GBIF get their own little data set page. So this is also nice. So if you are only interested in a certain data set, you can, of course, only look at that data set. Um, yeah. Um, so you might have in your imagination, uh, and this might be a good way to explain GBIF to someone who is a novice, is that it's a big data aggregator. We have all these sources like iNaturalist and eBird and or some museum or some other herbarium. And we just crunch it all together and we make a gigantic table. And this is actually a helpful mental model in some circumstances. But of course, that type of mental model will hide a lot of complexity, which is taking place uh, at GBIF, where we are you know, putting this data into a registry where we track sort of the metadata of the publishers and the data sets and uh, applying keys. And, we're also, of course, building big tables still, and and uh, all these sort of services sort of support a nice API layer, which powers sort of the front-facing things that users see, like uh, downloads in the web portal, or even like little tools like RGBIF. Um, and then also the API, of course, powers maps. I connected it here, but it's it's just a wire diagram, so don't take it too literally. And we also have now cloud exports, of course. So we have all these nice little features. And then, uh, of course, this is, there's even more complexity you could add. There's a big, gigantic sort of taxonomic backbone that gets built, which supports everything that GBIF does. So this is supported largely by Catalog of Life and a lot by Plazi as well and other checklists. And this powers things like this, the species uh, pages and things like that. And also maps sort of organizes all of GBIF. So that's sort of a... You can imagine this is a wire diagram of how GBIF is working. So this is kind of my mental model of GBIF. So hopefully that's helpful for you as well. But uh, you might be wondering uh, what is happening inside of this like a uh, 
bubble here. There might be a lot happening in there. Um, and so let's just walk through a few examples. So every occurrence record that comes into GBIF comes in as the original occurrence record. Um, and you can see that the original occurrence record initially you might notice that it's a lot more sparse than the interpreted uh, record. So the interpreted record has a lot more fields filled in. And this is a nice feature of GBIF processing. So we see that we lowered the case here. Uh, we corrected the spelling of this one. So, and then we also changed the author name here. Uh, we also filled in the higher taxonomy of this record, which is great. And we also inferred that this is an accepted taxonomic status because this is an accepted scientific name. And we've also flagged the record, of course, that so that, that we've done this. So because we wasn't matched exactly, it gets a taxon match fuzzy flag, which is nice. So that gives the user a nice clean record, but also notifies them that GBIF did something. And we also can move down to the location part of the table, and we can see that GBIF is doing like less here, uh, but still a few interesting things. So we've inferred the country code from the coordinates, uh, and we've also filled in the geodetic datum because this is not something that's often filled in, but it is often this like very common datum. And then we've also rounded the coordinates. So this is a big, long, really precise coordinate here, and we rounded it to six decimal places. Um, and you notice that these flags here get like less emphasis because they're not as uh, they're not as like uh, serious changes as the ones above for the other flag. Um, and then we also, so remember the nice clean map of Botswana. So another nice thing that GBIF does is we do this country coordinate mismatch flag. So in this map, all of the records are claiming to be in country or country code Japan. So we can clearly see that most of these are not falling within what most users would want to have if they were going to download all the records from Japan. So this is a nice little location flag. Um, and so then if you were to look up a map of Botswana you wouldn't, or Japan, you wouldn't get all these extra extraneous points. You get a nice clean map. Um, yeah, and they get that flag. Um, so we can also look at some more obscure flags, some that might be more confusing if you are uh, let's say a publisher of some collection or something like that. So you might get back a institution match fuzzy. So when I first looked at this example, I was also a bit confused by what institution match fuzzy would mean when it seems to be matching the exact institution code. But uh, I looked it up and apparently this is this institution code is actually an alternative institution code. So this is not actually the accepted institution code, but an alternative identifier for this institution. So it gets an institution match fuzzy. Um, and that's the same thing goes for this entomology. So even though it looks like it matches exactly, it's the, actually the alternative identifier. Um, hopefully that made sense. Um, and then here we see there's a, here's a new flag, which um, people might not have seen before. So this is a current status of for inferred from basis of record. So GBIF has a new little term that it's using called a current status, which tracks uh, absence and presence records. So this record is inferred as being present. Um, this is interesting because we can actually see that the individual count is zero, right? So you would think maybe this is an absence and they didn't see anything, but uh, the processing is smart enough now where we take all preserved specimens and we put them as present because we don't expect a, a, a museum to have pinned nothing to their board, right? So they don't, they didn't pin an absence to their preserved specimens. That has to be a present record. So the, the interpretation is pretty smart and it's able to flag and give you a nice complete record where the original record might have been more sparse. Um, okay, and then we of course flag like mundane things like this common geospatial issues like a zero coordinate where you have a common default location values. Um, okay, so hopefully that gave you like a taste of the sort of changes and the sort of things that are happening with uh, GBIF processing. So the nice thing about GBIF is we have a tool called the data validator, which allows 
publishers to sort of preview these flags and make corrections before their data set becomes like sort of public on GBIF. So this is a nice tool and it uh, gives you back all your flags. And so if you were gonna plug it into the wire diagram, it would look like this. So you your herbarium would first, before it published a GBIF would first get some validation and then the validator would go through all of this step here and then send back to the herbarium the flags and other things, how it might look on GBIF. Um, so this is kind of how the front end of this tool looks. Um, it's quite an old tool now, so probably many people in the audience have used it, but it's possible that some people in the audience are not aware that uh, in 2018, uh, GBIF processing sort of underwent a rewrite. So we switched to a sort of totally different architecture. And this was to improve speed and maintainability. And there's some ideas of connecting with ALA better. Um, but part of the problem with this was that uh, the data validator just sort of fell out of sync with GBIP processing. So no longer were you getting the new flags or so anything new that we were doing on gbif.org was not making it back to the publishers at the validator. So you wouldn't be getting those flags. So that is a problem and it still is actually existing today, but I'm happy to announce that uh, uh, the validator is the current validator or the product in production validator is very close to matching uh, GBIF processing. And Nikolai, the developer of this pipeline is on the call so he can verify this is this not true, but the new validator, which actually matches all of GBIF processing, is a sort of a late stage of development. So you can actually plug on our development site, you can actually plug in a data set and it will give you back all the live flags. I think we're just waiting for uh, UI to and a little bit more testing before that's complete. So here's a sort of more complex diagram of GBIF processing. So you can see that. In this architecture, the validator is using exactly the same infrastructure as any data set would, and it just would give back exactly what any data set would. So this is nice. So any new flags will become part of the validator. Um, and you can sort of see some of the technologies here that are powering this. I'm not going to go too deep into this. Uh, if someone has a really technical question, we can go back and refer to this slide. Um, okay, so so there's some new validator planned features. So the emphasis on the planned part. Uh, so we plan to match GBIF processing, so that's a given. So we want to return the same flags and the same type of uh, processing as you would if you were to publish it to gbif.org. We hope that there's a report that gets created. So no longer do you have to just sort of page through issues on the GBIF web page, you can actually get a downloadable report where you could maybe do something with it in your own uh, preferred tool. So you have a, maybe IDs mapped to issues or something like that. And then uh, we hope, one minute, okay, yeah. So we hope to add maps, uh, that would be nice. I think a lot of data quality issues that come into GBIF can be easily spotted if you just had your data plotted. Um, and then we plan to prioritize these sort of more, what I would consider more important uh, flags, like what, where, when flags I hope get more priority. Um, and then we hope that the flags give some maybe solutions or something like that. And then also perhaps uh, users have experienced this before, but the old validator, you would sort of lose your validation completely unless you uh, booked mark the page. So if you hit back on the <laughs> validator, we would totally lose your validation and have to run it again. That was quite annoying. So we're hoping to have bookmarkable pages so that you don't lose your validation. And I guess since we're running out of time, I won't uh, talk about the other issues, but maybe someone could ask a question about that and we can discuss it. Um, yeah, so that's all for my uh, presentation. Uh, yes. I guess I'll stop sharing now. Thanks, John. I always thought of GBIF as just one big table, but. <laughs> we have one quick question, Dimi, Dimitri. Uh, I don't see any questions on the, on the Q&A. Um, I will invent one. 
because we have the time. Um, John, for the checking, um, one thing what, what for me, I, I, I sometimes notice is that if your observations for your occurrences are really close to the border, the interpretation sometimes is not correct uh, by the, the by GDIF. Um, any idea? This is probably because of the of the of the layers are not one hundred percent or a, a mapping, but this is maybe something which can be looked upon. Or what is your idea about this? Uh, yes, I cannot comment too much on the specifics here, uh, but the yes, that is probably just to do with if you're getting that issue, it has to do with the uh, uh, polygon probably resolution or something like that. Um, I don't think, yeah, I think it's kind of in, it's kind of uh, sad that I'm pretty sure, like, even if you fill in all your, uh, well, no, if you fill in, let's say, if you fill in all your country code and country information, I'm pretty sure that we will not, you will get a country yeah. coordinate mismatch it's, it's, flag it's, still, yes. It's, it's so. been a while, but but that's the case. So the country code is correct and the and the coordinate is just next to the border. It will give, it will tell me that my occurrences are in Holland and they are not. Yes, but yes. Anyway, I think I, there's I, been just some discussion about a buffer or something so. like that. But <laughs> yes, so. it's not been implemented. Yes, yes, it's a, it's a known issue. And I think it has to do just with, the polygon resolution usually it is not that big of an issue because of the like easy easy and things like that but yeah it is still an issue to get these no job, really... i had to invent the question like... because there were no uh, questions oh, okay. in the Q &A. so but there is one uh, at the moment okay. um uh, came across cases where borders are politically contested how would gb react to this how to choose which country that's an interesting question I hope that someone on the dev team will respond in the chat because this Matt, please respond. <laughs> um, I think we we try and follow the publisher's opinion um, in some cases, and in other cases, we're relying on public open data sources like Natural Earth. Um, but if you want answers to difficult political questions, you'll need to ask people in the participation team who aren't on this chat, who aren't on this call. Thank you, Matt. Shelley, I think we can uh, go to you again. Thank you, John. Yes, thank you, John. Really informative. All right. Next, we have Patricia Morgan. Pat, are you ready to roll? And Patricia's going to talk about describing living collections and specimens. Over to you, Pat. OK. Um, so good day, everybody, uh, depending on which time zone you are. Uh, my presentation will be on uh, the describing the living collections and specimens that are the outcomes of a workshop organized in the framework of the cost mobilize action, which is a, an EU program uh, system. So first of all, what are living collections? Uh, so they can be understood uh, in many ways. There are the indoor and outdoor living plant collections of which you can see illustrations here. And often also the, the seed banks collections are uh, associated to this. And this can be collection used for research propagation or uh, also to, for public awareness and inform the, the public. Uh, then you have the living collections from the zoos and aquaria uh, that are uh, living animals, but they also have uh, biobanks and cryopreservation for their, their breeding programs. And then you can also add uh, microorganisms. That's not me. <laughs> can somebody cut this? <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, so after this music interlude for coming tonight, not now. Uh, so the microorganism collections uh, 
which are also known sometimes as culture collections, uh, are a wide uh, variety of different microorganisms that reach from bacteria, viruses, plasmids, etc. Uh, can also be fungi collections, uh, diatoms, uh, cyanobacteria, and so forth. And then associated to living collections, you can also have frozen tissues and uh, molecular collections uh, that are considered in the framework. So many of our institutions have these kinds of collection uh, next to the preserved collection. And this is why we found it interesting to look uh, into how to describe them. And in this context, we organized a workshop the 14th and 15th of September online, uh, which aim was to explore different aspects of this, notably the alignment on the collection description, how to interlink preserved collection and living collection, because many of these living collection may also have uh, preserved what voucher specimens uh, to identify where are the which are the requirements and the needs of the curators and users of these collections to also increase the discoverability and uh, uh, the links that exist in these collections between each other because sometimes they are discoverable in their own uh, group, but not uh, to the other networks. Uh, and also it's difficult to reuse them or to uh, work with them in this interlinking collection uh, activities. Uh, more linking to TEDWIC activities, we wanted to look in the extended digital specimens activities, how this uh, can fit in and also how to work with the different uh, TEDWIC standards groups and on the controlled vocabularies that are needed within these disciplines. Um, so as speakers, as we had people on board who were maybe less familiar with TEDWIC, uh, we had uh, Matt Warbun who presented first uh, TEDWIC standards with uh, focusing mainly for this workshop on the TEDWIC collection description standards so that we were all on the same page for, for the next uh, activities of that workshop. Then from a very important community, we had Suzanne Sharok who presented uh, how the Botanical Garden Convention International is um, handling their collections with the Garden Church and also the IPEN, the, uh, system for the exchange uh, network for the exchanges of plants. And uh, she explained also their plants in terms of uh, standards and processes and their issues uh, to access the information on the, the living collection and garden information worldwide. And then we had a presentation from the ESA, the European Association of Zoo and Aquaria from uh, Dalia Conde, who presented uh, a bit the goal of the ESA Association, this network of European zoos and aquaria, who work together notably in exchange and breeding programs, and but also for veterinary issues and other uh, important uh, cares for for zoo animals. And she also presented the uh, collection. Uh, and managing system that they use, pieces 360 for the global information that they share among each other. Uh, additional key players were present. They didn't present, but contributed a lot to the discussion, notably the GGBN, the Global Genome Biodiversity Network. And we had also representative from the World Federation of Culture Collection with the former president of the Worldwide Association, which is also the head of the Belgian component of this uh, network. And we had also the curator of the Cyanobacteria collection within that network who, who contributed to, to explain what are their needs and issues in managing those types of collections. Uh, we had five uh, breakout sessions uh, foreseen, but already the first day when we did all this presentation, we noticed that there were a lot of common issues. So we decided to merge uh, the session one and two on voucher specimens with the living at sessions and the living collections and how GBIF can handle them. 
And uh, because we find a lot of uh, possible synergy between botanical gardens, living collections, zoos, and aquarium, they also sit together. And then we had a session on the culture collection best practices. Uh, it will be too much to explain everything here in the 10 minutes, but you have here the link if you want to see all the notes and recordings and discussions. Uh, and also if you want to, to further comments afterwards on our findings. So I summarize here some of the kind, key findings we had during the breakout sessions. So they clearly have an issue with the localities because uh, they are ex situ collection only and some are and or collected in the wild. And it's not always easy to, to determine if you should put the location where the origin uh, specimen was collected in the world or the, the, the seeds and when they are propagated ex situ inside the botanical garden or, or the zoos. Uh, they found out that terms like cultivated, managed need to be added in the standards and better defined. There were discussion if the Darwin core uh, occurrence record can be an answer to these issues. The workflows in the real world and in the data world, they also find that they may differ and need to be further addressed. Uh, there were also discussion if the Darwin core term related resource classes can be used to interlink the different components of the living collections uh, within a workflow. They also identified that specimens ID for preserved specimens is easier to handle as the accession ID due to the workflow and as this organism are alive, grow, reproduce, die, propagate, and uh, others are born from them with new individuals, but they may keep the, the same accession ID. Uh, and for animals, for example, you can easily identify it when they have died uh, in the workflow, but it is absolutely not the case for plants of microorganism who can enter in dormant phase and then uh, revive again. Um, the voucher uh, samples like uh, diatoms or bacteria, they can contain multiple species and specimens. They are, this can be related to what happens also with preserved collections where they can be kept in jars or pots. Then you have also for the seeds, microorganisms, biobanks, where it can refer more to a sample that is kept in a bag, petri dish, jar, pot, or something like that. And it is not linked to one individual specimens, like it might be the case in the larger preserved specimens. The zoos, on the other side, refer much more to individual specimens, like it is the case in preserved collection. Uh, and for the plant and animal exchange and breeding programs, they find out that there is a lot they can learn from each other. For example, BGCI has locally different collection management system, while ESA use all in all their different zoos, the species uh, 360 uh, same system to, to manage their collections. Uh, the common views that came out uh, from this session was that uh, for living specimens, as there are ethical issues involves pathogens, risk of invasive species, and so forth, uh, it is important to collaborate with another group of the cost uh, action about loans and permits. There are also higher requirements, for example, because of this pathogen and security lab that they need ISO standards and processes and accreditation which are not open standards like we use in TEDWIC, but there are still means to, to collaborate and exchange, and it's not that much a barrier. Um, all agreed that they need comparable metrics about those collections that is for the moment not really possible to get and easily in a comparable way. They all also agreed that we should not reinvent the wheel. And when there are existing standards or in elaboration, in those different networks, uh, we should collaborate with TEDWIC standards to interlink them and not necessarily recreate new standards. And they also insisted, for example, on this new MIRI infrastructure for microbial resources that is busy developing standards for the microorganisms. Uh, the next step will be that we want to have a TEDWIC task group on the living collections. 
We want to dialogue with GBIF because even if in Darwin Core and ABCD some fields and concepts exist, they are not always searchable or discoverable uh, in the portal. Uh, we would also like to look into the definitions of the terms in the context, because we find out that we use the same terms in these different collections groups, but they don't always have the same definition or are understood in the same way. Uh, we will then also look into interlinking the standards uh, of existing living collection groups uh, to, to progress on this and uh, testing the existing uh, TEDWIC standards. We have already modules for the different living collections like in ABCD and also how we can use them uh, in Darwin Core. And we plan to organize a second workshop with these topics in 22, again with uh, the cost mobilized action. Uh, and to finish, I would like to thank uh, TEDWIC and uh, Martin, Gabi and Eva who helped a lot with the organization of these workshops and all the speakers and also our funding bodies. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Patricia. Um, thank, thank you, Patricia. I don't, I don't have any questions at the moment in the Q&A, but I maybe have an announcement instead of inventing a question this time. If you want to share, and that's for everybody, your music, there is a link for uh, uh, Radio Tadwick in the chat. Thank you. Any questions? It's not, now is the moment, or I'll move over to Shelly. Questions? All right. Well, thank you, Patricia. That was very informative. Well, I, have, I, have, I have a hand up from James. James? A question from James? Hey, a question, more a comment, just to say, Patricia, that uh, we benefited from that workshop in, in our DINA work and okay. that uh, there is a real challenge, something we really need to invest time in, especially with the molecular technologies and all of the new microbiome work. We're going to have to store these specimens and we're going to have to look more at interactions between specimens, samples and, and provenance. We, we have some work to do here. And I think that was a nice story. Uh, the use cases that came out of there are exactly what we hear uh, because we're in DINA having to deal with living collections, viruses, bacteria, fungal collections. So we have that mix. It's challenging. We all know this, but it's really timely. And, and I think a lot more thought uh, needs to come into this. And so this is a great start. Thank you. All right. If there are no more questions, we will move on. Well, I see a finger. Yeah, I see a question coming up. Um, what are the main global infrastructures to share living collections data? Any gaps, Patricia, any idea? Oh, uh, yeah, well, there is this MIRI infrastructure that I cited for microorganism. And uh, while they were in my presentation, the main of them. Um, so, um, yeah, they can actually be shared uh, on GBIF. Uh, we just have to, to fill in these uh, concepts that already exist either in ABCD or identify those in Darwin Core and then also discuss with GBIF that they are searchable and discoverable. Because for the moment, apparently when you search uh, that you want to specifically have living collection of these different types of collection, it's not easy to, to tag them and to count them <laughs> with these metrics. But then uh, if water have more uh, question, we can discuss it because it would be a bit long to go through all the EU infrastructures and so on that uh, deal with living collection, but there are certainly some uh, that, that deal with them, but they are a bit fragmented, like, like I presented, and work too much each with their uh, standards that they are developing, and the challenge is to interlink them and make them fair, actually. Okay, thank you, Patricia. I've got a final, very small question. Could you share the tiny link to the workshops you held last year, in, maybe in the chat? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
and so it's like there's a lot more discussion to be had offline there. Excellent. All right, moving on. Ian, are you ready to roll? Next we um, have Ian. Ready, Ray. yes. Yes, and he'll be talking on fun and easy georeferencing with a new online tool from South Africa. Something I can use. Over to you, Ian. All right, thank you very much. So I'm seeing it's uh, 13 past the hour here. Um, all right, so um, I built a new georeferencing tool. Part of the problem uh, that we have with georeferencing here in South Africa um, is illustrated here in this slide. Uh, so we're looking at this top little nubbin that sticks off um, South Africa here. Um, it's traditionally called the Kalahari Hemsbok National Park. The park, um, the, the original boundary takes up this portion over here. It's since been extended to include um, uh, uh, an extensive area in Botswana and it's changed its name as well. Um, but on the screen here, we have um, roughly 200 localities, all with exactly the same locality name, Kalahari Hemsbok National Park. There are 190 unique georeferences for that locality. Um, and all of these come out of a single data set for a single taxon. So essentially there's been 190 times the amount of work that should have happened for georeferencing this locality. So we have the same, geo, uh, the same locality being georeferenced multiple times. We have issues with standards and protocols not being used, despite the fact that there's been quite extensive training for georeferencing here in South Africa in using those protocols, things like point radius method. And um, most people are still georeferencing on spreadsheets or directly in their collection databases. So to solve this problem, I thought the, for, the first step is to see a georeference is as a, a reusable entity. So um, here we have that locality um, plus all of the georeference information. And if we store that in a database, uh, then we can reuse it. This is the interface uh, to the georeferencing tool. Um, if when you when you start the georeferencing process, you start off by dropping a uh, a, a data set um, with with a few thousand uh, specimen records um, into the tool, and it, it does a whole lot of processing on that data set, primarily to group all the localities into similar group into groups of similar localities using. Uh, fuzzy string matching. And then when you access the data set, this is the, the sort of the primary georeferencing interface over here um, that you work with. And uh, here we have the A particular locality group on the left-hand side. So you can see here, these localities are, are roughly similar to one another. Um, it then calls up a, uh, it calls up uh, potential matching georeferences from the database backend uh, that you can uh, use um, it, it, it maps all of those onto the map as well. And then if you click on any of these uh, georeferences, it shows you the, the, the details for that georeference on the right-hand side here, and it highlights that georeference for you on the map. Um, in this case, you can see there's a lot of information missing. So, um, so, so, well, so the first thing is that it's using Darwin core georeference fields. Uh, so things like uncertainty, the datum is there, georef by is there. I've included an, a, a georeferencer ID field, protocol sources, remarks, um, et cetera. Um, in this particular case, um, I've gone and I've selected now a set of localities on the left, which I am happy represent the same locality. Um, and I've populated the rest of the data uh, for the georeference here because um, it was missing. Um, but you can see it warns me here that it's not happy with the coordinates provided because um, there's two decimal places here. So I've got to go and get better coordinates. And so QGIS is um, a core component of our georeferencing workflow. We've got a standard QGIS project with a whole set of uh, sort of uh, useful layers for georeferencing, lots of topo cadastral maps. And in this particular case, so this is a, um, an ACOX uh, data set that we're georeferencing. Um, we've got ACOX original maps. He was a very diligent collector and he actually indicated in little points on the map. You might not be able to see them so well, but he made little red marks on these old maps of all the places that he collected. And so um, I was able to work out that this is the locality that he's talking about here. I updated the coordinates and then you just click a button which basically applies this georeference to all of the records um, that are associated with these locality strings over here. So that's what you're doing. The process is 
selecting or, or creating georeferences that you use for these um, localities. Okay, so getting to the fun bit is we've got this um, set of uh, stats at the top of the screen. And, um, and these, these are basically uh, your counts for the data set. So it's telling things like how many georeferences you've done on this data set uh, today, um, how many specimen records are associated with those georeferences. It tells you how many you've got uh, in total, how many have been done by, uh, by the whole team for the week. Um, and and, and when, you, when you finish a locality group, these numbers pop at you, these little colored blocks kind of pop at the top of the screen. And it creates a feeling of like, ooh, that was fun, that, that's, that's progress. Okay, cool, let me see if I can get them to, uh, let me see if I can get them to pop again. Um, it's th this, this, uh, these updates are done in real time. So if there's anybody else on your team working on a particular data set at the same time and they georeference some records, uh, these stats pop as well. And so you can see um, who it was that updated. Um, and that's uh, uh, um, uh, that sort of, you see, oh, someone else has georeferenced some records. Um, I better get on with it and, uh, and get going with mine as well. Um, it's got several little utilities here that just help with the process. So you've got an option, this little uh, marker point with a line through it is saying, um, these, you, you, uh, this is saying no georeferences for these localities. That's, these are for uh, ambiguous or very imprecise localities where you can't actually add a georeference and you can uh, cross them off the list and you can uh, bookmark a record, a locality group to come back to later. You can skip a locality group if you think one of your teammates might be better able to georeference. And, um, and then you can also put filters on so that you see particular locality groups for a country or a state or province in your um, data set so that you can kind of focus your georeferencing um, a little bit more intensively as well. And um, the tool also includes several kind of uh, uh, graphs that just kind of show nice progress on the data set. Um, you can see uh, in this case, you're seeing progress over time with um, getting the percentage of records completed. Um, you can see how many records have been georeferenced by each georeferencer in the team. I've taken the names off here. Um, this is not something that they can see themselves. The team members can't see how other people are georeferencing uh, because that's not something that, um, that our georeferencers are happy with. They don't like it being a, an explicit competition like that. Um, and you can also see sort of counts per week um, over time and you can look at um, how particular individuals are doing. And, and so, so the manager of a team can see this and they can see um, how particular individuals are doing in the team. And, um, and use that for like performance metrics and things like that. So the workflow is fairly standard. I mean, I think this is how everyone does things. You, you extract the data from your database. Um, it needs to be transformed to Darwin Core. There's only, there's only a handful of fields that we need to be Darwin Core fields in a data set. You upload it to, um, uh, uh, to uh, the georeferencing tool. Um, you do your georeferencing in the tool. It's always helpful to have minions helping you with the georeferencing. Uh, there's a verification stage in the tool as well where you can check everything. Um, and when the data set is done, uh, or what we call done, we only ever get to about 80 or 90% in the data set and the rest are not uh, georeferenceable. Uh, you download the data again and then you can update. Um, you need to, the, you obviously, the best is to do a bit of data wrangling to, to update your database. Okay, so there have been some quite significant challenges. Um, thanks, time noted there. Um, I think one of the big things which is worth not noting, I I've populated this database with about 300,000 existing georeferences that I extracted from Sanby's database and various other collections databases. And getting good quality georeferences has been very, very difficult. We're seeing now that we're reusing these georeferences, uh, we're seeing just um, how many errors there are, um, how often they're incorrect and incomplete and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, another big uh, issue is the verification and, and quality control process. And I think that's something that I'm seeing in a lot of our data work is just how much, um, how much effort verification and quality control um, takes and how often it's actually neglected. And then the last point is just if you're using a georeference that somebody else has georeferenced and you're applying it to a set of georeferences, so you're now georeferencing these records, who is Darwin Core georeferenced by? 
So if you're interested to know more about the tool, please get in touch on data at nscf.org.za. Um, and um, I've got the social media links to the NSCF here as well. Um, those links will be dropped into the chat. Please, um, please do follow the NSCF if you can. And um, I would like to thank our team of data technicians and Hester Stain, who have been instrumental in the process of developing and testing this tool. Thank you. Yes, what a fantastic tool. I like the cheerleader effect up the top. That's a really great idea. I love it. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble seeing where I need to stop sharing. Okay, got it. Okay, great. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, the cheer, I haven't heard of that, the cheerleader effect. That's nice. Yeah. Do we have yeah. any questions? For Thank Ian? you, Ian. I've got one question from Erica. Um, it looks like you're suggesting concepts that users can apply to the sources field. Are any of those sources applied automatically? Uh, let's say from a base map that the program knows uh, is a visible layer. No, so um, you, you have to add the sources manually. Yes, I, I know I know what Eric is saying. Um, so the tool, the georeferencing tool is kind of like your, it's just your data, data set management tool. It doesn't know anything about what's going on uh, in QGIS or, or what, what your particular set of sources are for georeferencing a data set. Um, but the, they're, they're on a pick list. The sources are on a pick list. And if you add a new source, it automatically gets added to your pick list so in, in case you need to reuse it again. Um, and you can add multiple sources. That's the main thing. You can add as many sources as you want. Thank you, uh, Ian. I don't have any more questions at the moment. So three, two, one, Shelley. So in the, in the chat, we have a link there that Hester has added in case anyone's interested. All right, thanks, Ian. Um, moving on, um, Tom Aguata, um is going to speak on BD Dashboard, an infrastructure for biodiversity dashboards in R. You're ready to roll, I see. Good to go. All yours, Tom. Yeah, great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. So I will talk about dashboards. So uh, hopefully you will see lots of uh, plots and, uh, and interactivity. So what makes so special about uh, uh, dashboards? Why they're so useful and, and basically staple for data exploration? Because they're so useful for when you have high volume data, when you have complex data, we have heterogeneous data, sounds familiar. And especially when uh, you need to drill, you have the drilling down capabilities, which gives you uh, an opportunity to unveil sometimes hidden patterns, sometimes data anomalies. And when you when we want to try to develop a, a dashboard system, so from the user side, this kind of uh, framework has to be extremely intuitive and easy to use, hopefully domain specific, and if possible, even goal specific, so they don't need to have a plain canvas so they can start uh, uh, have a good starting point, but also quite flexible so they can really fine tune it to their own need. Uh, obviously it should be quite fast and uh, hopefully frictionless, meaning that it should be really highly integrated with their uh, entire data analysis pipeline because data exploration is a critical uh, first stage. And since we are doing science, then it has to be reproducible. And from a developer, from the developer side, uh, since we are dealing with biodiversity data, it has, the system has to be tailored for this type of data. Uh, it should be agile enough, meaning that it should give us enough freedom to, uh, to be able to develop different dashboards easily enough uh, because when the small stuff become exhausting, then the big the big stuff become impossible. So this is a cru crucial uh, element. Uh, it has to be test driven, and when you have so many UI parts, it's not a trivial. Uh, obviously, this need to be the testing. Everything should be maintainable, hopefully collaborative, and if we can able to uh, to have all these condition met, then 
we can say we have a sustainable uh, system. So having this uh, vision in mind, we we and the Bidiverse team uh, invoked, uh, I think two, three years ago, uh, into the journey of developing BD dashboards. Uh, and BD dashboard is part of the Bidiverse, which is a, a toolkit for, uh, for data quality assessment. In R, I will talk about it a bit in the end, so don't worry, you don't need to, it's not critical for, for this part. Uh, and when we developing dashboards part first, we need to decide what, which are the critical uh, components. So obviously interactive plots are needed. Uh, so we found that the best value per effort uh, system for plotting, so it was Plotly. When we, when we evaluated different uh, ones, Plotly was uh, highly, highly uh, uh, prolific in what we can do with it. Uh, for interactive data tables, we chose DDT also because it's really, really mature uh, uh, table uh, framework. For maps, obviously leaflet. Uh, if you don't know, you know, welcome to everything here is a link. It's like the almost the, the obvious choice uh, to this uh, for mapping. Uh, and of course we can uh, have different native uh, components, like Shiny components. Uh, this was developed in Shiny. So uh, we were trying to see what can be done in Shiny uh, to really uh, wrap everything together. So each type of uh, component was, uh, we would try to understand how to make it extremely, extremely modular. Uh, so for that, we developed additional functionality. For example, for each plot comes with a plot field selector. So next, next to each plot, you have like a small uh, setting button and you basically can change all the fields that you, can, that you see. Uh, the field selector knows automatically uh, what, kind, what types of fields uh, this plot has, what kind of uh, types of, of, uh, of field it can accept. So if you have a numeric, you show you only the numeric part. If you, if you press Y and it's a character, you see only the, the character. So it, it overlay all the possible uh, fields in your data and it allows you to quickly uh, adjust the plot or try a new one. And it, this is for each plot. Uh, the same for the table, but here you can just choose which fields you want to see in the table. It's, it's very uh, easy and, 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 uh, and quick to change. Uh, and for the maps, we, you can choose uh, your base map. So there are different options, very different uh, options for the different base maps, different uh, added value. And you can choose which field uh, to, to, to single out all the unique values of, of this field. So if we're choosing kingdom, or if we have different kingdoms in the, in the, in the map, each kingdom will be uh, its own layer and will have its own color. So we added like this extra easy to use functionality. In addition, for the plots, we developed a plot navigation component. And the idea of a plot navigation, uh, it's not just for nav navigating the plot. Uh, it's basically for sort of a safe, uh, safe mechanism, like fail safe mechanism, that since you can easily choose different uh, fields, you can accidentally choose a very, very extremely heterogeneous field. And for some plots, it doesn't make sense to show 400 uh, bar plots in a plot. It's not uh, reasonable. So each type of plot, we can uh, decide what is the threshold of maximum uh, objects to show. And but user can always. So this will be like the default uh, setting. But user can always uh, uh, use the slider and adjust uh, and the, the the number of, of objects. But it's it's user it's it's a user decision to do it. Uh, so it's it's much uh, it's much easier to render. So if there is like a big huge plot, uh, the entire dashboard will not get stuck because of uh, highly rendering uh, efforts. Uh, so we talked about uh, dashboard and drilling down. So drilling down is all about creating reactivity. How each element is reacting to a different element. Uh, so when you are filtering one plot, you want to see all, how all the other elements are uh, being filtered. The same, so we can really drill down uh, uh, and see 
uh, further into your data. So we here develop our almost our own uh, reactivity model. Uh, we tested different, uh, the, the common one, uh, and we were able to actually find something that is really, really slick. And it's for us as the developer, we don't need to worry about reactivity. We can just put all the elements. Uh, each element basically is all, for us, it's almost like a one line of code. So we just list all the elements that we want to see in the page and the reactivity is being taken care of itself. Uh, we also the design different generic tabs. Here we design like a data summary tab, a missing data tab, special oriented tab, taxonomic oriented temporal, uh, just to have a good feeling of what we can do with different elements. But each, this is just for our experimentation, each tab can actually be generated to its own dashboard. Uh, we have no problem to add as many pages as we want and uh, as many elements as we want and create different dashboard if needed. It's, it's for us a developer, it's quite easy. Um, so that's the idea behind the dashboard. Uh, what we're now working on is the testing framework. We were able to crack exactly how to do it because it's a, it's a point of no return. We need to really commit to, to, the, to, the, to the approach that you, are, uh, uh, that you are adopting. And we were able to, to have a really sound and, and, and robust uh, uh, strategy for that, so we are happy about that. But in regard to reproducibility, we not, not yet had the time to crack it. It is crackable, but it's uh, it needs to be very taken very carefully uh, because it's such a crucial uh, element. Uh, we need to update all the documentation. Uh, you can see that in the readme file, but in in, in GitHub. Um, but we are still playing around with the CSS because we're trying to build like. The optimum uh, dark mode, so it's not that. So now BD dashboard is a part of the BD verse, and the BD verse is, we hope for it to be an infrastructure or a modular toolkit for biodiversity data quality in R. It has an application for Darwinizing field name standardization, uh, for data quality checks, uh, system that allows to add a lot of checks and have a really robust uh, mechanism for for testing them and to generate and to, to use all of this element and to create a, a workflow system, which is called BD Clean. So there are questionnaires and each questionnaire is reacting to uh, uh, a certain... Uh... So the issue is, uh, is that the BDverse is, I'm kind of put it on hold because I don't yet feel ready that, uh, although all, all the papers are ready for more than a year, the, my issue is that as, as, a, as a PhD student, I know that the, the commitment that you had to, has to put on your uh, analysis frameworks. And when we uh, uh, publishing a toolkit, it's sort of an unwritten contract that, that, this, uh, that we have to supply our users a, a peace of mind for at least five to seven years, meaning that we can for sure be able to support their needs and to maintain it and to, uh, and to keep improving it. So it's, yeah, it's in under the open source uh, framework, it should be possible, but basically we were able to achieve all of this using mostly Google of Summer of Code students. Uh, so all of, the, all of our developers, most of them uh, have no association with biodiversity data. So it was very cool to, to be able to achieve it, but we need to, to branch out and, and use more uh, biodiversity users and developers. Uh, and BDiverse is, uh, it's an infrastructure. Uh, we can do it properly if we are not uh, taking care of all the DevOps aspect uh, and all of the high quality documentation. And it's lots of moving parts uh, and we need to really um, manage it. Uh, uh, I would not say flawlessly, but, but to a very, very high quality uh, aspect, we're taking a lot of responsibility and to help users with the analysis, it has to be uh, uh, really, really robust. Uh, so I think we have an amazing, 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 I would think it's the most amazing prototype that I think I saw because we're really integrating uh, all the all the R ecosystem uh, stuff are really, really synthesized here to really uh, an amazing degree. Um, but without 
Yeah, um, it's my nice slide. Uh, so I'm here actually kind of, I don't know exactly how, what kind of next step to take uh, because I don't want to be operating on a, on, a, on a wishful thinking that, yeah, we will use the users to battle test the Bitiverse, but if it will become too hard, then, then uh, since we're all volunteering here, this is basically almost considered like a citizen science project. It's, it's can be classified such. Uh, so I'm really, really thinking and really like to hear what you're thinking, uh, how to promote the collaboration uh, with other biodiversity developers, uh, obviously with domain experts, uh, because we really want to refine it. We, we build it in a way that it will be easy for us to adjust this to many, many different uh, uh, scenarios, but it all, all comes with the price. Uh, and the key is how to ensure the support of of, of key stakeholders. So this will give me the peace of mind that the users are uh, can be uh, can have their peace of mind. Um, so with this uh, semi-optimistic note, I can I can finish my 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 part for now. Thank you so much, Donna. That was great, great toolkit, great visualization tools. Um, hopefully, you can find a way to continue supporting it. And I'm sure there's some ideas out in the audience. Any questions at all? Any suggestions? For the moment, for, uh, for the moment I don't have any questions, uh, but I expect to see some questions between this and 10 seconds. Sure. So I would just <laughs> say that feel free to contact me. You don't have to ask any question. You can, you can invite a, a show, a complete showdown of the Bidiverse. You don't need to decide. We can uh, showcase everything that we learn. Uh, really, just email me, and we can schedule a, a meeting. It's it's for the community. Like it, it's uh, it's. I mean, if we have to, we can scrap it for parts. But I think it's such an amazing, uh, uh, like, uh, ecosystem that that can be good for a base, a good base for something. Uh, we obviously want to do like an hour open size submission for, for the entire Bidiverse, but we cannot do the hour open size submission without ensuring that we know that we're gonna have enough uh, longevity. Um, so, yeah. Okay, Tomer, thank you. I can keep talking, I have no problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, nice. thank you very much. So very interesting. I hope that something comes out. Um, Shelley? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully the conversation continues offline and uh, we hope to see more of your, your work cool. in, the, in the near future. All right. Cool. So last but definitely not least, we have for today in this um, contributed oral session, Sophie Mio. Hopefully I've said that correctly. Um, apologize if not. Um, bio blitzes. Bio blitz is more than a bit of fun. And there's been a bio blitz going on all week and it continues. And looking forward to hearing your talk, Sophie. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Thank you. Perfect. Uh, yes, so I will be talking about BioBlitzes. Um, as there is this BioBlitz running parallel to this conference, I think most of you know uh, what a BioBlitz is, more or less. But for those who don't know, uh, BioBlitzes are a rapid assessment of the biodiversity present in a specific geographic area over a relatively short period of time in which multiple people engage and participate, either being expert scientists, naturalists, or amateurs, often from the local community. So you can imagine a BioBlitz in many different formats. And at one end of the spectrum, you have expert BioBlitzes, and they are all about science. Um, so they want to make an as complete as possible inventory of a certain area. And on the other end of the spectrum, there are biodiversity festivals, uh, which are about uh, public engagement and making people aware of what is biodiversity. And somewhere in the middle, that is where you can find most of the bio blitzes, 
they are also called uh, guided bio blitzes, and they really bring together the experts and the public and um, make them interact so that experts can help the public with their identifications. Um, and this is also where apps really changed things and uh, kind of broke uh, this trade-off between um, science and engagement because you can really now as an amateur uh, go into the field with your smartphone and get assistance with identifying uh, thanks to image recognition and the entire community behind uh, iNaturalist. So when you organize a BioBlitz and approach an expert um, to ask them if they want to join, then um, the reply is often, yeah, sure, it's fun, it's good outreach, but what's really in it for me and, and what is the real value of a bio blitz and how can you measure it? And it's a good question. So is a bio blitz just a bit of fun or is it more? So to look uh, more in detail at what are the outputs of bio blitzes, uh, we conducted a literature review, so we found 60 articles that uh, gave us more details on the event. Uh, we also extracted um, details on iNaturalist projects uh, through the iNaturalist API. So all projects um, between 2013 and 2020 that had uh, BioBlitz in their title. Um, and we, of course, also uh, organized our own BioBliss, and by we, I mean uh, the Alien CSI uh, Cost Action. The, it was a BioBliss of 24 hours, and it was held in Akrotiri, Cyprus. So when you look at the description of those uh, 1,860 uh, iNaturalist projects with BioBlitz in their title, you can immediately see uh, what the BioBlitz is about. So definitely it's about biodiversity. It's about um, finding as many species as possible. It's also about fun, but it's definitely not the, the main word to attract people and engage them uh, in the, in the BioBlitz. Um, it's about learning wildlife, about wild, wildlife in the city, uh, parks, national parks, and definitely it's about engagement. Um, so the most bio blitzes uh, take place in the Northern Hemisphere, especially USA and Canada, uh, also Europe, and they typically last uh, less than three days they have an average of 123 participants. And in the case of iNaturalist, there's also a bunch of identifiers that not necessarily need to be involved in the actual bio bleach, but they, uh, they are definitely engaged by it. Um, 2,156 observations on average on 300 species. Um, they are often held uh, during the weekend, and especially Saturday is a popular day for a bio blitz. Um, April or September are the most popular months, so fall or um, um, uh, um, spring, sorry. And what we found from the literature review is that um, it's not often just one or organization that uh, organizes this bio blitz, but there are often three more uh, partners. Well, on average, we found uh, with many more partner organizations. So it's also some sort of networking and collaboration between organizations. So we looked at uh, BioBlitz aims and uh, we ranked five, uh, the five most important aims uh, for holding a BioBlitz. And so uh, one is uh, species inventory. Um, second one is learning about biodiversity, uh, discovering new species, uh, promotion of an organization and uh, public engagement. And we found that uh, species inventory uh, discovery of new species and public engagement were uh, the highest ranked aims uh, from our literature review. So many people want uh, to organize a bio blitz because they want to make an inventory of a certain area. And the main output that you can find from bio blitzes are species uh, checklists. 
And of course, you can do a complete inventory in 24 or 48 hours time. Um, and you will always have uh, some biases that are typical for all biodiversity surveys, such as um, bias towards uh, bigger and more charismatic organisms. But if you're planning a bio bliss, you can really think this through during your planning and uh, kind of circumvent these issues by, for example, inviting uh, more experts, uh, more uh, bigger variation in experts that work on different taxa, uh, but also, for example, organize, um, repeat the bio blitz in different seasons uh, or um, standardize uh, your methodology. And also, I should note that um, bio blitzes are more structured in a way as compared to ad hoc uh, recording because. Um, you get the, the sense of uh, survey intensity because the area is uh, fixed. You know more or less how many participants you had and um, also the duration is fixed. So this is uh, quite important metadata to interpret uh, these records. You can also use bio blitzes uh, to discover new species and those new species, well, new species uh, to an area mostly. Um, and those new species can be rare native species, but they can also be a uh, new alien species, so new introductions. And so, for example, with the Akrotiri BioBlitz, uh, we found uh, 31 uh, new species for Akrotiri, of which five were new for the whole of Cyprus. And we also added um, 270 uh, new um, record species to the Akrotiri species checklist on GBIF, of which 12 were alien species. So we don't know whether they will get invasive, they might not, um, but it's really good to publish this kind of data either through iNaturalist or directly on GBIF so that invasion biologists do get, uh, get to see this uh, data and they can, can work with this. So then we were curious to see if the BioBlitz um, changes the recording activity or the recording behavior, well, activity of uh, the participants. So from those 1,860 projects on iNaturalist, we selected randomly 100 and extracted the recording activity of um, in total 3,400 participants. And what we see, so we, um, we compared the activity in the year before the BioBlitz and the year after the BioBlitz. And when we subtract those two, we see that there is a boost in activity right after the BioBlitz. And um, well, unsurprisingly, it declines over time. But we see that um, the decline uh, is half, or it declines by half the activity at about 10, uh, no, 12 to 13 weeks after uh, the BioBlitz has finished. So the BioBlitz really uh, has an effect on recording activity, um, um, an effect that we can see for many weeks after the BioBlitz. So bio blitzes are medium-sized recording activities and they fill a gap between individual unstructured biodiversity recording and large-scale structured recording schemes. And they are ideal for creating communities and creating stewardships, especially because they're place-based. They can give the participants this greater connection to a place. And then I'm thinking of what um, Alice said on Monday in the opening session that um, place-based research um, can be used to answer place-based questions and solve place-based issues. And so with BioBlitzes, which is a kind of place-based research, um, they are often um, organized by an organization that has an influence on the management of this specific area. And it's this strong link between recording and taking action that could really motivate the participants or the local community to keep on participating in as many bio blitzes as you or want to organize. And bio blitzes are 
are also good for um, including participants that don't usually find their way to citizen science. Uh, one example uh, is uh, Black Birders Week, for example, where they really uh, try to reach a certain group of people. Um, then uh, people tend to get really bored during lockdown. And as a home safari organizer, I can uh, testify that um, these kind of activities uh, can really engage people during pandemics. And uh, imagine all the technology that is used now to detect um, um, difficult to record uh, species, such as eDNA, uh, wildlife cameras, drones, they can all be used in BioBlitzes. So a few take home messages and uh, recommendations. Um, if you want to promote your organization in biodiversity and put it on the map, organize a BioBlitz. Um, use apps like iNaturalist or publish your uh, data and metadata to GBIF. Uh, there are advantages in repeating a bio blitz uh, for engagements so to keep the people engaged and keep them recording, uh, getting a complete inventory. Um, and of course, also uh, you can uh, optimize and standardize uh, your methodology and repeat your bio blitz then um, to, to monitor a certain site. Uh, bio blitzes are an intervention in time that uh, triggers wildlife recording of uh, participants. And this continuous recording is, for example, very important in early, early warning for invasive species. And then finally, uh, last but not least, uh, bio blitzes are fun. And apparently it's this kind of fun that people uh, tend to remember many weeks after the event. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And I also want to thank all the people that participated, especially alien CSI people that uh, participated in the Aquatiri BioBlitz. And I can take uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was Brilliant presentation. Um, Biobilixes, of course, are very much fun, but they're also extremely valuable sources of data. Thank you. Um, um, if you could possibly, uh, there we go. Yes. Sharing and and uh, Dimitri, have we got any questions for Sophie yet? Yes, we have a question for Sophie. Um, uh, Sophie from Christopher, are there resources available to assist in the organization of a Bioblitz? Is there something available? Yes, yes, there are uh, guides to organize bio blitzes. Yes, I, I can only suggest Google it, and uh, there are a lot of resources from the UK, especially. Uh, yes, many, many uh, materials to read. Um, I, for the moment, I don't have any further questions. Yes, I have a further question from Kimberly. Did you notice any geographic patterns in bioblitzes in terms of total bioblitzes frequency, etc.? Yes, so the, the map I showed um, was really from those observations from iNaturalist. And um, iNaturalist is definitely not uh, used in all uh, countries. Uh, some countries have their own um, recording apps, like in Belgium, here, for example, uh, we have another very popular app. So um, what you see basically on that map is not necessarily the, um, the distribution of bio blitzes, but more uh, the use of iNaturalist for bio blitzes. Uh, but it already gives you an idea. And um, yeah, don't forget that there might be events that are bio blitzes, but are not called uh, bio blitzes. So for example, in, in, we saw that in Russia, there are, and those Russians apparently also use iNaturalist and um, they have projects that um, are in essence bio blitzes, uh, but they don't call them bio blitzes. So they were, uh, for example, less represented on the map that I showed. So that's, yeah. I hope that gives yeah. you. What's, what's in the name is Sophie. Thank you all. There yeah, are already, exactly. some, <laughs> already some links appearing in the, in the chat. 
uh, I can remind you to the fact that we are having our own bio blitz here in, uh, in that week, which is running until October uh, 24th. So you still have a little bit of time after the conference to go out in nature and bio blitz things. Uh, for the moment, we got like 100 and, uh, 1,169 observations and 652 species. And we have 47 members in that bio blitz. So, and if I look, we are with 115 people here. So there is uh, still room for uh, much nature to catch there. I'm checking for has, further questions. Anyone has I any didn't questions receive any more topic? questions, uh, especially for Sophie, but we are happy to take any questions for the whole session, I think, yeah. Yeah, we have a few more minutes left in this session. I think it runs for another 15 minutes. So if anyone's got any questions at all, fire away, please do. But thank you, Sophie. Um, fabulous talk. Yeah. Um, we've stunned everyone to silence, I think. Well, um, if there's no further questions, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. I'd like to thank Dimitri for helping me out here with the moderation today. Um, thanks to all of our eight speakers of fabulous work and, um, and um, looking forward to learning more in the future from what you're working on and what you're doing. Do you have anything further to add, Dimitri? No. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for all coming uh, along as uh, well and listening. I yeah. thought I saw a hand of Peter, but it's a thumbs up. So <laughs> we're there for the questions. <laughs> but everyone, thank join me in thanking all of our speakers. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thanks. <laughs>